The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 31. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 31. Ninth Book, Part 3 in my efforts to free myself from the pressure of the too gloomy and powerful which continued to rule within me and seemed to me sometimes a strength sometimes as weakness i was thoroughly assisted by that open social stirring manner of life which attracted me more and more to which i accustomed myself and which i at last learned to enjoy with perfect freedom it is not difficult to remark in the world that man feels himself most freely and most perfectly rid of his own feelings when he represents to himself the faults of others and expatiates upon them with complacent censoriousness it is a tolerably pleasant sensation even to set ourselves above our equals by disapprobation and misrepresentation for which reason good society whether it consists of few or many is most delighted with it but nothing equals the comfortable self-complacency when we erect ourselves into judges of our superiors and of those who are set over us of princes and statesmen when we find public institutions unfit and injudicious only consider the possible and actual obstacles and recognize neither the greatness of the invention nor the cooperation which is to be expected from time and circumstances in every undertaking whoever remembers the condition of the french kingdom and is accurately and circumstantially acquainted with it from later writings will easily figure to himself how at that time in the alsatian semi france people used to talk about the king and his ministers about the court and court favourites these were new subjects for my love of instructing myself and very welcome ones to my pertness and youthful conceit i observed everything accurately noted it down industriously and i now see from the little that is left that such accounts although are only put together on the moment out of fables and uncertain general rumours always have a certain value in after times because they serve to confront and compare the secret made known at last with what was then already discovered and public and the judgment of contemporaries to or false with the convictions of posterity striking and daily before the eyes of us street loungers was the project for beautifying the city the execution of which according to drafts and plans began in the strangest fashion to pass from sketches and plans into reality intendant gayo had undertaken to new model the angular and uneven lanes of strasbourg and to lay the foundations of a respectable handsome city regulated by line and level upon this blondel a parisian architect drew a plan by which an hundred and forty householders gained in room eighty lost and the rest remained in their former condition this plan accepted but not to be put into execution at once now should in course of time have been approaching completion and meanwhile the city oddly enough wavered between form and formlessness if for instance a crooked side of a street was to be straightened the first man who felt disposed to build moved forward to the appointed line 
perhaps to his next neighbour, but perhaps also the third or fourth resident from him, by which projections the most awkward recesses were left, like front courtyards before the houses in the background. They would not use force, yet without compulsion they would never have got on, on which account no man, when his house was once condemned, ventured to improve or replace anything that related to the street. All these strange accidental inconveniences gave to us rambling idlers the most welcome opportunity of practising our ridicule, of making proposals in the manner of Bayrish for accelerating the completion, and of constantly doubting the possibility of it, although many a newly erected handsome building should have brought us to other thoughts. How far that project was advanced by the length of time, I cannot say. Another subject on which the Protestant Strasbourgers liked to converse was the expulsion of the Jesuits. These fathers, as soon as the city had fallen to the share of the French, had made their appearance and sought a domicilium. But they soon extended themselves and built a magnificent college, which bordered so closely on the minster that the back of the church covered a third part of its front. It was to be a complete quadrangle and have a garden in the middle. Three sides of it were finished. It is of stone and solid like all the buildings of these fathers. That the Protestants were pushed hard, if not oppressed by them, lay in the plan of the society, which made it a duty to restore the old religion in its whole compass. Their fall, therefore, awakened the greatest satisfaction in the opposite party, and people saw not without pleasure how they sold their wines, carried away their books, and the building was assigned to another, perhaps less active, order. How glad are men when they get rid of an opponent, or only of a guardian! And the herd does not reflect that where there is no dog, it is exposed to wolves. Now, since every city must have its tragedy at which children and children's children shudder, so in Strasbourg frequent mention was made of the unfortunate Pretor Klingling, who, after he had mounted the highest step of earthly felicity, ruled city and country with almost absolute power, and enjoyed all that wealth, rank, and influence could afford, had at last lost the favour of the court, and was dragged up to answer for all in which he had been indulged hitherto. Nay, he was even thrown into prison, where, more than seventy years old, he died an ambiguous death. This and other tales, that night of St. Louis, our fellow boarder, knew how to tell with passion and animation, for which reason I was fond of accompanying him in his walks, unlike the others who avoided such invitations and left me alone with him. As with new acquaintances, I generally took my ease for a long time, without thinking much about them or the effect which they were exercising upon me, so I only remarked gradually that his stories and opinions rather unsettled and confused than instructed and enlightened me. I never knew what to make of him, although the riddle might easily have been solved. He belonged to the many to whom life offers no results and who therefore, from first to last, exert themselves on individual objects. Unfortunately, he had with this a decided desire, nay, even passion, for meditating, without having any capacity for thinking. And in such men a particular notion easily fixes itself fast, which may be regarded as a mental disease. To such a fixed view he always came back again, and was thus in the long run excessively tiresome. 
he would bitterly complain of the decline of his memory especially with regard to the latest events and maintained by a logic of his own that all virtue springs from a good memory and all vice on the contrary from forgetfulness this doctrine he contrived to carry out with much acuteness as indeed anything may be maintained when one has no compunction to use words altogether vaguely and to employ and apply them in a sense now wider now narrower now closer now more remote at first it was amusing to hear him nay his persuasiveness even astonished us we fancied we were standing before a rhetorical sophist who for jest and practice knew how to give a fair appearance to the strangest things unfortunately this first impression became blunted but too soon for at the end of every discourse manage the thing as i would the man came back again to the same theme he was not to be held fast to older events though they interested him although he had them present to his mind with their minutest circumstances indeed he was often by a small circumstance snatched out of the middle of a wild historical narrative and thrust into his detestable favourite thought one of our afternoon walks was particularly unfortunate in this respect the account of it may stand here instead of similar cases which might weary if not vex the reader on the way through the city we were met by an old female mendicant who by her beggings and importunities disturbed him in his story pack yourself off old witch said he and walked by she shouted after him the well-known retort only somewhat changed since she saw well that the unfriendly man was old himself if you did not wish to be old you should have had yourself hanged in your youth he turned round violently and i feared a scene hanged cried he have myself hanged no that could not have been i was too honest a fellow for that but hang myself hang up my own self that is true that i should have done i should have turned a charge of powder against myself that i might not live to see that i am not even worth that any more the woman stood as if petrified but he continued you have said a great truth which mother and as they have neither drowned nor burned you yet you shall be paid for your proverb he handed her a boussole a coin not usually given to a beggar we had crossed over the first rhine bridge and were going to the inn where we meant to stop and i was trying to lead him back to our previous conversation when unexpectedly a very pretty girl met us on the pleasant footpath remained standing before us bowed prettily and cried hey hey captain where are you going and whatever else is usually said on such an occasion mademoiselle replied he somewhat embarrassed i know not how said she with graceful astonishment do you forget your friends so soon the word forget fretted him he shook his head and replied peevishly enough truly mademoiselle i did not know she now retorted with some humour yet very temperately take care captain i may mistake you another time and so she hurried past taking huge strides without looking round at once my fellow-traveller struck his forehead with both his fists oh what an ass i am exclaimed he what an old ass i am now you see whether i am right or not and then in a very violent manner he went on with his usual sayings and opinions in which this case still more confirmed him i cannot and would not repeat what a philippic discourse he held against himself at last he turned to me and said i call you to witness 
you remember that small ware woman at the corner who is neither young nor pretty i salute her every time we pass and often exchange a couple of friendly words with her and yet it is thirty years ago since she was gracious to me but now i swear it is not four weeks since this young lady showed herself more complacent to me than was reasonable and yet i will not recognize her but insult her in return for her favours do i not always say that ingratitude is the greatest of vices and no man will be ungrateful if he were not forgetful we went into the inn and nothing but the tippling swarming crowd in the ante-room stopped the invectives which he rattled off against himself and his contemporaries he was silent and i hoped pacified when we stepped into an upper chamber where he found the young man pacing up and down alone whom the captain saluted by name i was pleased to become acquainted with him for the old fellow had said much good of him to me and had told me that this young man being employed in the war bureau had often disinterestedly done him very good service when the pensions were stopped i was glad that the conversation took a general turn and while we were carrying it on we drank a bottle of wine but here unluckily another infirmity which my knight had in common with obstinate men developed itself for as on the whole he could not get rid of that fixed notion so did he stick fast to a disagreeable impression of the moment and suffer his feelings to run on without moderation his last vexation about himself had not yet died away and now was added something new although of quite a different kind he had not long cast his eyes here and there before he noticed on the table a double portion of coffee and two cups and might besides being a man of gallantry have traced some other indication that the young man had not been so solitary all the time and scarcely had the conjecture arisen in his mind and ripened into a probability that the pretty girl had been paying a visit here than the most outrageous jealousy added itself to that first vexation so as to completely perplex him now before i could suspect anything for i had hitherto been conversing quite harmlessly with the young man the captain in an unpleasant tone which i well knew began to be satirical about the pair of cups and about this and that the young man surprised tried to turn it off pleasantly and sensibly as is the custom among men of good breeding but the old fellow continued to be unmercifully rude so that there was nothing left for the other to do but to seize his hat and cane and at his departure to leave behind him a pretty unequivocal challenge the fury of the captain now burst out the more vehemently as he had in the interim drunk another bottle of wine almost by himself he struck the table with his fist and cried more than once i will strike him dead it was not however meant quite so badly as it sounded for he often used this phrase when any one opposed or otherwise displeased him just as unexpectedly the business grew worse on our return for i had the want of foresight to represent to him his ingratitude towards the young man and to remind him how strongly he had praised to me the ready obligingness of this official person no oh, such rage of a man against himself i never saw again it was the most passionate conclusion to that beginning to which the pretty girl had given occasion here i saw sorrow and repentance carried into caricature and as all passion supplies the place of genius to a point really genius-like he then went over all the incidents of our afternoon ramble again employed them rhetorically for his own self-reproach 
brought up the old witch at last before him once more and perplexed himself to such a degree that i could not help fearing he would throw himself into the rhine could i have been sure of fishing him out again quickly like mentor his telemachus he might have made the leap and i should have brought him home cooled down for the occasion i immediately confided the affair to lerse and we went the next morning to the young man whom my friend in his dry way set laughing we agreed to bring about an accidental meeting where a reconciliation should take place of itself the drollest thing about it was that this time the captain too had slept off his rudeness and found himself ready to apologize to the young man to whom petty quarrels were of some consequence all was arranged in one morning and as the affair had not been kept quite secret i did not escape the jokes of my friends who might have foretold me from their own experience how troublesome the friendship of the captain could become upon occasion but now while i am thinking what should be imparted next there comes again into my thoughts by a strange play of memory that reverend minster building to which in those days i devoted particular attention and which in general constantly presents itself to the eye both in the city and in the country the more i considered the facade the more was that first impression strengthened and developed that here the sublime had entered into alliance with the pleasing if the vast when it appears as a mass before us is not to terrify if it is not to confuse when we seek to investigate its details it must enter into an unnatural apparently impossible connection it must associate to itself the pleasing but now since it will be impossible for us to speak of the impression of the minster except by considering both these incompatible qualities as united so do we already see from this in what high value we must hold this ancient monument and we begin in earnest to describe how such contradictory elements could peaceably interpenetrate and unite themselves first of all without thinking of the towers we devote our considerations to the facade alone which powerfully strikes the eye as an upright oblong parallelogram if we approach it at twilight in the moonshine on a starlight night when the parts appear more or less indistinct and at last disappear we see only a colossal wall the height of which bears an advantageous proportion to the breadth if we view it by day and by the power of the mind abstract from the details we recognize the front of a building which not only encloses the space within but also covers much in its vicinity the openings of this monstrous surface point to internal necessities and according to these we can at once divide it into nine compartments the great middle door which opens into the nave of the church first meets the eye on both sides of it lie two smaller ones belonging to the crossways over the chief door our glance falls upon the wheel-shaped window which is to spread an awe-inspiring light within the church and its vaulted arches at its sides appear two large perpendicular oblong openings which form a striking contrast with the middle one and indicate that they belong to the base of the rising towers in the third story are three openings in a row which are designed for belfries and other church necessities above them one sees the whole horizontally closed by the balustrade of the gallery instead of a cornice these nine spaces described are supported enclosed and separated into three great perpendicular divisions 
by four pillars rising up from the ground now as it cannot be denied that there is in the whole mass a fine proportion of height to breadth so also in the details it maintains a somewhat uniform lightness by means of these pillars and the narrow compartments between them but if we adhere to our abstraction and imagine to ourselves this immense wall without ornaments with firm buttresses with the necessary openings in it but only so far as necessity requires them we even then must allow that these chief divisions are in good proportion thus the whole will appear solemn and noble indeed but always heavily unpleasant and being without ornament unartistical for a work of art the whole of which is conceived in great simple harmonious parts makes indeed a noble and dignified impression but the peculiar enjoyment which the pleasing produces can only find place in the consonance of all developed details and it is precisely here that the building we are examining satisfies us in the highest degree for we see all the ornaments fully suited to every part which they adorn they are subordinate to it they seem to have grown out of it such a manifoldness always gives great pleasure since it flows of its own accord from the suitable and therefore at the same time awakens the feeling of unity it is only in such cases that the execution is prized as the summit of art by such means now was a solid piece of masonry an impenetrable wall which had moreover to announce itself as the base of two heaven-high towers made to appear to the eye as if resting on itself consisting in itself but at the same time light and adorned and though pierced through in a thousand places to give the idea of indestructible firmness this riddle is solved in the happiest manner the openings in the wall its solid parts the pillars everything has its peculiar character which proceeds from its particular destination this communicates itself by degrees to the subdivisions hence everything is adorned in proportionate taste the great as well as the small is in the right place and can be easily comprehended and thus the pleasing presents itself in the vast i would refer only to the doors sinking in perspective into the thickness of the wall and adorned without end in their columns and pointed arches the window with its rows springing out of the round form to the outline of its framework as well as to the slender reed-like pillars of the perpendicular compartments let one represent to himself the pillars retreating step by step accompanied by little slender light pillared pointed structures likewise striving upwards and furnished with canopies to shelter the images of the saints and how at last every rib every boss seems like a flower head and row of leaves or some other natural object transformed into stone one may compare if not the building itself yet representations of the whole and of its parts for the purpose of reviewing and giving life to what i have said it may seem exaggerated to many for i myself though transported into love for this work at first sight required a long time to make myself intimately acquainted with its value End of section thirty one